Dramatic violence erupts in central Cairo as more pressure mounts on the Egyptian president to leave office immediately, even though he says he won't run for re-election. So what are the political options open to Mubarak? And what role will Egypt's military play in any transition of power? This is Inside Story. Hello, I'm Darren Jordan. Hundreds of thousands have gathered across Egypt in the biggest rally since protests began last week. In the latest development, pro- and anti-government demonstrators have clashed in Cairo. Meanwhile, the people remain defiant. They want President Mubarak to go now. Well, away from the demonstrations, there is worrying political uncertainty. Mubarak says he will stand down, but how will the transition of power be managed? And what role will Egypt's military play in shaping the country's future? In a moment, we'll look at some of the political options. But first, the turmoil on the streets. Alan Fisher reports. They've been fighting running battles in the street. What began as an exchange of chants and insults quickly became much worse. At one point, pro-Mubarak supporters ploughed through the crowd using whips and sticks. Some were overpowered, pulled from the animal and beaten. We have no idea what may have happened to them. While some answered the call to prayer, the cameras picked up where crowds found opponents separated from their group. Soon, they were swallowed up in a sea of anger and hate. As people ran for safety, the army, which had tried to keep both sides apart, could only look on helplessly. The army had feared scenes like this, earlier issuing a TV appeal for people to go home. The armed forces are calling on you, not by force, but by the desire of love to Egypt. You demonstrated to express your demands, and it is you who is capable of restoring normal life to Egypt. We are for you, by you and with you. We will continue to safeguard our great homeland, no matter what the challenges are. Egypt will live on, free, strong and peaceful. The anti-Mubarak camp say the government sent in supporters to disrupt what has been until now a peaceful protest. The Interior Ministry denies plainclothes security are involved. Standoffs are being reported in a number of side streets around the main square. Some openly goading the other side, dodging rocks and stones being thrown at them. Makeshift barricades are being used to advance positions. The authorities in Cairo had amended the curfew across Egypt. It should start later and end earlier. But there's now a huge worry about what the night may bring. Alan Fisher, Al Jazeera. Well, after delivering his second speech in four days, vowing to complete his term and then go, some say Mubarak has been, be has been buying time to consolidate the power of the security structure in the face of demonstrations. The current situation could evolve in a number of ways. Mubarak remains in power until the end of his term in September. There is the scenario of a military takeover, followed by a transition to a civilian democracy. Finally, Mubarak resigns under pressure from demonstrators and the international community. Well, in this last case, one of four options could take place. According to the Constitution, the newly appointed vice president assumes power and forms a unity government. A council of wise men to run the country and rewrite the Constitution. Mohamed el Baradei has called for a presidential council of three members and a government of technocrats to manage the state. The Muslim Brotherhood have rejected all of the above and suggest that the Supreme Constitutional Court's chief judge should assume the presidency and form a new unity government. Well, joining us now in London is Omar Asher, lecturer in the politics of the modern Arab world. In Aberdeen, Scotland, Andrea Tetty, lecturer in international relations at the University of Aberdeen. Gentlemen, welcome to the programme. 
Andrea Tetti, let me start with the latest events first on the streets of Cairo. Dramatic scenes uh, in Tahrir Square between supporters and opponents uh, of President Mubarak. Is this likely, do you think, to start shifting the balance of power on the streets? Well, it's, it's difficult to see how... Um, well, put it this way, it's, the, it's a lot more challenging now for the protesters to uh, keep out of violence. And the problem is that as soon as violence... Uh, is something that's done by both sides, then that gives the security um, uh, forces a, a, an excuse for a crackdown and things become a lot more complicated. I mean, in this latest speech, President Mubarak promised to leave office, of course, at the next polls, but he also pledged constitutional mm. reform. I mean, what sort of reforms would need to be brought in place to placate the protesters, and will this be enough, do you think? Well, certainly not the uh, reforms that he spoke of in his speech. I mean, he spoke about reforming Article 76 and 77, which regulate the eligibility of candidacy towards the, to the presidency. But there are other articles in the Constitution and a raft of enacting legislation that would need to be substantially changed uh, in order for this to be even palatable to the, uh, to the opposition. For example, Article 88, which regulates the supervision of elections. Now, Article 88 used to say uh, that uh, supervision was to be provided by judicial bodies. Now, recently, um, Mubarak proposed uh, in 2005, actually, he proposed um, the, uh, the change of that article to allow Ministry of Interior officials to supervise elections. And if you want any kind of evidence of how that might go and how impartial that might uh, uh, turn out to be, and we only have to look at the elections of, uh, uh, of November and December of last year. Uh, which were deeply, deeply rigged and ended up with 93.1% in favour of the NDP. So not good auspices. But having said that, uh, there is a fundamental political problem, and that is Mubarak and the regime's trustworthiness. And I don't see how the bulk of the protesters uh, would find even broader, more constitutionally uh, satisfying or sound uh, changes politically acceptable, I mean, simply because they cannot trust this regime. I mean, many many of the experts tell us that these reforms are very much uh, about freedom to run for office and limiting the powers of the president in terms of how many times or how many terms they can spend in office. I mean, how yeah. crucial are these reforms uh, to the future democracy of the country? Well, they're absolutely crucial. Uh, because it, to have a functioning democracy, you have to have a good uh, democratic, a sound democratic design. But they're not enough. So what you have to have is good design and good implementation. And on both of those counts, the last five years since the so-called Cairo Spring of 2005, there is absolutely no evidence that, uh, despite any kind of initial optimism, that the regime is minded to deliver on, in, on any of this. Uh, but uh, Mubarak's party, the NDP, is not about to, you know, to, of course, sign away all its power. Presumably, they want to preserve uh, perhaps the status quo. But are we starting to see splits start to emerge within the party itself? Uh, starting is a big word. I mean, we've seen those divisions for years, at least since 2005. In the last elections, uh, which is probably our best, um, our best indication from the outside, in the last elections, in uh, the the party actually ran at least two tickets in each constituency, sometimes four, and there was a split between the sort of the Gamalites, the old guard, and uh, a series of independent, undecided. Uh, NDP members who had not decided yet which uh, which horse to back. That problem, so to speak, may have been resolved, at least for the short term, in, in the sense that Gamal seems to have disappeared from the scene. But uh, the indication that we take from this is that the NDP is deeply split on these issues. So under the current constitution, Andrea, what are the scenarios mm. that are legally allowed to develop? I mean, what are the options open now as things stand? Well, the ones that you mentioned uh, that you mentioned earlier on yourself, but uh, I have to say that at this point, it's not so much a question of the constitutional parameters of any kind of reform. It's the question of the political credibility of commitment to them. Yesterday, when Mubarak announced, uh, uh, you know, the, the reform of Article 76 and 77 and the legislation unspecified, um, immediately there were the chance of leave, leave from the from the crowds in Tahrir. So. Uh, as I said, I think the important, I mean, the legal framework is important, but it is even more important that it be politically credible, and it's that political credibility in the eyes of the opposition that the regime does not have. So what do you see as an acceptable compromise, perhaps, in terms of how the transition could work? Because the scenes, of course, we're seeing uh, in Tahrir Square can't be allowed to continue, can they? Mm. 
Well, that depends on your point of view. It depends also on the, um, uh, in the sense that it depends on exactly what is going on at the higher echelons of the regime. From Sunday, it was very clear that Mubarak was weakened and uh, the appointment of the new cabinet, uh, cabinet illustrated that. Now, what was interesting about those appointments was that, uh, of course, Suleiman was appointed vice president, and, and that's uh, obviously important. But what was, I think, even more important was the fact that uh, Tantawi, the uh, former defense minister, not only retained his portfolio, but also became uh, uh, deputy prime minister. So it's unclear what that is. Is a possible signal that there is a, a, a game that is being played out within these three major figures in the regime and that the army has not yet decided, at least the leadership of the army, has not yet decided which side it's going to come down on. And the indications that we have the, the, in the last couple of hours from uh, Tahrir Square are that um, that at best we can hope in a profound ambiguity in the army. The fact that the army stood by while these so-called pro-Mubarak supporters, and I think all the evidence that we have is that they're not pro-Mubarak supporters, or at least they're pro-Mubarak supporters only in the sense that they are probably plain, plain clothes um, state security forces, um, that as these so-called pro-Mubarak protesters moved into Tahrir Square, the army stood by. Um, uh and that's not a good signal. OK, so we've, we've all started talking about this issue of the transition of power, but what does the Constitution mm. say about the transition of power, given that Mubarak's been in power for 30 years? I mean, somebody's going to have to go and dust off the Constitution book uh, to find out, aren't they? <laughs> yes. I mean, if he were to step down, okay, you have two broad election, broad scenarios. One is uh, him, he steps down, in which case uh, elections would be, uh, you know, there would be a temporary assumption of power by the vice president, and then, um, and then there would be elections. Uh, and the other is that he holds on to power, and that there is some kind of compromise that allows him to stay in place uh, until the elections that are set for September. Um, as I said, I think the latter scenario is politically very implausible, uh, simply because it's not acceptable to the opposition. Um, the former scenario uh, could play out in a number of different ways. Some people in the opposition have signaled that they are ready to do business with Suleiman. Um, the question is, are they serious about this, or is this simply a, a move to try and divide the regime, you know, Mubarak from Suleiman? Omar Asha, how worried are you about these later scenes we've been seeing in Tahrir Square? I mean, there were no police or soldiers intervening in the dramatic violence that we saw, but it's the first time we've seen this level of violence between both camps, haven't we? Yes, I'm actually quite worried because uh, there has been, since the, since the beginning of this uh, uh, crisis, there has been uh, uh, a tendency to do, use these methods of structured violence, mainly to push this from a revolution for freedom and democracy to a, a, a chaotic violence situation. So that had started first by the withdrawal of the Central Security Forces and the police force, and they were withdrawn in a, in a matter of, uh, of hours, or, or maybe less than, uh, less than hours. Uh, and uh, after that, the uh, systematic release of thousands of convicted uh, criminals, after that, rearming them and, uh, and sending them to the streets. Uh, and then we saw this, the army intervention and the civil defense uh, groups uh, form, uh, forming. Uh, they curbed this, uh, the, the violence created by that uh, uh, ordered situation for a while. Uh, and then now, uh, when the army statement uh, clearly stated they were, that they will not use violence against protesters and that the protesters' uh, demands are legitimate, and there was more international pres uh, pressures on uh, uh, Mubarak to, uh, uh, to leave, uh, we see yesterday the, his, uh, 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 his second speech, uh, more co a bit more concessions, and playing a bit on the emotional dimensions, like I, I want to die here. Uh, and, uh, and then we see uh, the disappearance again of the security forces. And then uh, folks who are said to be, uh, between quotations, supporters of Mubarak, we don't know who, who are they. Are they uh, security uh, men dressed in civilian clothes? Are they uh, folks from the NDP who have been uh, deployed? Uh, and then again, the withdrawal of the security forces to create a situation where this turns into a, a violent uh, situation. As you say, Mr. Mubarak has made some concessions. He sacked his cabinet, appointed new members, uh, and ordered the prime minister to push through democratic reforms and create new jobs. But some people say these concessions are perhaps designed to split the opposition. I mean, is this a clever move by Mubarak, do you think? Yeah, it's a clever move, but it's uh, it's uh, well, it's not enough. Uh, and the the for uh, a lot of the for most of the opposition, uh, the demands are still intact. The demands are uh, uh, Mubarak has to leave, 
uh, the parliament has to be dissolved. Uh, uh, its, its legality, its, its legitimacy is quite contested by courts. Uh, the, the, the formation of a, a transitional unity government that sets the scene for democratic uh, and free elections by, uh, via international monitoring. Uh, and uh, the trial, obviously, of Habib al-Adli. So uh, mo the first speech basically gave a demand that nobody really wanted, uh, the, uh, the, uh, or gave a concession that nobody wanted, the hiring of vice president. Uh, and then Mubarak uh, uh, brought two military men in civilian suits, one as a deputy, as a, vi a vice president, uh, and one as a, as a head of the prime minister. B both well, of them are uh, uh, his friends. Uh, both of them uh, are uh, quite uncompromising in their nature. Uh, so it's not really uh, 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 it's not really a concession. And then the second speech, uh, you had the uh, uh, and the second speech actually was announced by John Kerry before uh, Mubarak uh, said uh, said anything. He uh, CNN announced that uh, uh, Mubarak will will not will, will not uh, be a presidential candidate in September 2011. And then an hour later, or a few hours later, Mubarak comes uh, on the uh, on television saying the same the, exactly the same thing. So I don't know what kind of message this sends to the Egyptian people. All right, well, let's Millions put that of point. them putting let's, their lives on risk. Okay, well, on, let's, just put that point, let's just put that point to Andrea Tetti uh, in Scotland, because I saw you nodding your head there, Andrea. I mean, what did you make of the speeches? Mm. I think they were, I, I agree completely, I think they were vacuous concessions uh, designed to uh, weaken the opposition, split the opposition if possible, but also to send a message to Washington um, and to European capitals uh, to make it uh, perhaps easier for them to uh, withdraw from the kind of pro democratic uh, stances that have slowly begun to emerge since uh, Sunday from Washington and, and other and European capitals. I want to just ask you, Andrea, and stay with you for a second, because there are people that say this new mm. vice president, Omar Suleiman uh, himself, has a vested interest in preserving uh, the current structure and the hope, perhaps, uh, of inheriting the presidency uh, from Mubarak. Do you think he will do that or do you think he will work towards a transitional government, uh, as the international community mm. is suggesting? I think we have very little evidence, but being generous, we have very little evidence that Suleiman is interested in anything else but uh, assuming the presidency. Uh, before the last parliamentary, parliamentary elections, before this uh, uh, the January uprising, uh, Suleiman was one of three people who was uh, who was vaunted as uh, the possible um, successor to Mubarak, along with Tantawi and uh, Gamal, Mubarak's son. So I don't think we have the evidence that we have doesn't say that uh, uh, that he is a, a neutral person and uninterested in power, as uh, President Mubarak put it. Andrew, let me ask you. Uh, a question also on the military. I mean, many observers say that Egypt's military uh, is, of course, the key uh, to resolving this crisis. How respected is the military as an institution in Egypt and how critical is their role in resolving this crisis? Very much so in both, uh, to, in answer to both questions. Um, and in fact, you can see the, uh, the, the reception that the military got initially. Uh, we'll have to see how that reception changes after the events of last night in Alexandria and, uh, and uh, this morning. Uh, but they were initially received very, very well indeed, as we know. Um, but having said that, it is uh, difficult not to think that there have been uh, negotiations involving Tantawi and Suleiman and Mubarak for... Uh, succession and the, and as I was saying the 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 fact that uh, the military have not intervened in order to separate uh, the uh, the pro uh, democracy demonstrators and the so-called uh, um, pro Mubarak uh, demonstrators um, I think that is very significant Omar um, sure in London the question is going to okay sorry sorry um uh, Andrea go on no, sorry, the question is, is also how effective is the uh, protesters' uh, tactic of trying to bring the army on board? Because, of course, they are a very respected institution, but I think that it is uh, also very plausible that the opposition welcomed them with open arms and tried to, to, to work with them uh, so as to make officers on the ground even less likely to, uh, to fire on, on uh, pro-democracy demonstrators. Uh, let's ask so we'll Omar... Have to see how that plays out. OK, let's ask Omar Ashur in London uh, his views of the role of the army. I mean, how do the protesters view the army? I mean, do they respect the institution as a whole uh, and do they see it as perhaps untainted by corruption and under the direct influence of the Mubarak government? To a large degree, this, that's uh, the perception of the uh, overwhelming majority of the protesters, that the army is a respectable uh, institution. And the key, uh, th this crisis has two keys. One is the continuation of the uh, demonstration. And two is the uh, involvement uh, of the army on two levels. Uh, with regards to the protesters, it shouldn't use violence. And with regards to Mubarak, they should g really start pressuring him to leave, because the, 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 or else the situation will become this uh, chaotic violence. And the, 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 the state, basically, 
basically can collapse. We don't have, right now, it's a, a disaster in Egypt. There is no gas. There is a shortage of food. Uh, no, no banks are working, a, a ATM machines. So basically, the, 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 the whole system is not, the, the state system is not functioning. And it's all because Mubarak is, is still there and it does not want uh, to leave. Uh, but on the other side, th there is a, uh, I think the, the, the idea of moving towards uh, civ civilians between quotations, wearing civilian uh, uh, pro-regime uh, figures or forces wearing civilian clothes and fighting with the uh, demonstrators uh, to provoke them to, to, to make this turn into violence is a clever strategy, and, but uh, it, uh, this was a strategy probably number three or, or alternative number three because the army did not want to shoot on demonstrators. Uh, the, uh, I know uh, I have friends in the army, uh, 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 mid, mid ranks and low ranks, and uh, all of them were basically the, 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 the three of them I called. They, they had the same statement: we were not going to fire, or we're not going to order our units to fire on uh, on demonstrators. And that was uh, made very clear. So I think uh, uh, the, uh, the, the order by senior ranks to uh, lower and middle ranks uh, to, to fire or to engage violently with demonstrators, uh, there was worries that th th these orders would not be carried on, and therefore they moved into the alternative plan of sending okay. uh, c c civilians, uh, between quotation civilians, uh, to, to fight with the demonstrators. Andrea Tetti in Aberdeen, uh, let me come back to you uh, with a sort of wider question in terms of the international response. We've seen growing international pressure for a political resolution to this crisis we're seeing on the streets of Egypt. Barack Obama has called for what he's described as an orderly transition uh, to a democratic future. Haven't the Americans just stopped short of saying Mubarak must go anyway? Yes, and, and that makes complete uh, sense from their point of view. And, and also, to a certain degree, um, uh, it doesn't... Um, I mean, coming out with that kind of uh, call would, uh, would have a very... Uh, unstable political repercussions potentially on the, uh, the, the confrontation between the pro-democracy de protesters and the regime. So it, it, makes, uh, it makes sense as, a, as a, a stance for Washington to have at the moment. Um, Omar Ashur, I mean, is there a worry that uh, if Egypt descends into chaos, you were talking about the sort of chaotic scenes that we've been witnessing uh, on our TV screens. If Egypt descends into chaos, could this unrest spread to other Middle Eastern countries as well? Is there a danger of contagion, perhaps? Uh, there is danger of contagion, uh, but uh, the, the, the problem is uh, uh, th this chaos is, is structured. This chaos came by orders of the regime uh, right now because it, di it didn't come out of the protesters. It didn't descend into chaos because of uh, 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 fighting that just erupted uh, spontaneously. It was very well structured process, and it, it, it be it's basically a copy from what happened in Argentina in the dirty war in the 80s and uh, had have some elements of similarities from what happened in Algeria in the 90s very well uh, structured in that sense and it's uh, unbelievable that the that the uh, western democracies are watching this and not even flagging the legal card the legal implications of this because this is just uh, uh, an attempt uh, to Will, can end up into committing massacres against uh, uh, if, if it turned out into chaotic violence and it is it is done uh, structured it is done as a policy and this policy obviously uh, has uh, must have legal consequences uh, for Mubarak and for the ones okay. who ordered it. Now they are tr talking about trying uh, uh, Habib al Adli, or there are uh, there are rumors or there are some reports saying about uh, the the the, uh, the trying of Habib al Adli because of handling the situation. Okay, okay. I have to I have to, uh, I have to, I have to get a final tribunal. thought. Okay, I have to get a final thought uh, from Andrea Tetti because we're running out of time. Andrea Tetti, just very briefly, what political scenario do you see developing now to end this crisis? Very briefly. Uh, I think it's it's very difficult to tell. It will depend, for one thing, on what it, what the reasons for um, the army b behavior of not separating the protesters t uh, today. We have to see why they did that, and then we'll be able to see a little bit more uh, where this is going. Omar Ashour, a very but brief final thought from very, you. Very worrying. Okay, Omar Ashour in London, a very brief final thought from you. What scenario now do you really see hope developing? That this we really, uh, 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 well, there are hopes and there are rational calculations. Rational calculations is that uh, I don't think Mubarak will go that easy. I think the, 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 uh, the two uh, 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 decisive factors is, one, the continuation of peaceful demonstrations, uh, the maturity of the Egyptian people in dealing with this crisis, uh, as, uh, calling for their demands peacefully. And on the other hand, uh, the, the, the army has to stand up to this uh, crisis and, uh, and uh, mature enough for this crisis and put an end to it uh, by basically uh, uh, tapping on the shoulder of Mubarak, telling him you served for 30 years and it's time to go now. OK, thanks to our guests in London, Omar Ashur in Aberdeen, Scotland, Andrea Tetti. And thank you so much 
for joining us here on this edition of Inside Story. We, of course, welcome your comments and your suggestions. Please email them to us at insidestory at aljazeera.net. From the whole team here, goodbye for now. Thank you.